So my name is Laura Uber, and I run a graphic design business called Design on Purpose. And I typically work with clients on brand development, website design and development, help them communicate consistently about their brands. Awesome. Good. So you sent me a list of clients that you that you have worked with in the past. I see you've got a lot of coaches like myself, which is phenomenal. Um, but I want to know, like you've worked with nonprofits, recruiting and talent acquisition, HR companies, coaching, consulting, wealth management, finance, real estate, marketing, um, construction, um, B2C. So tell me out of all of these, what, what, which one do you prefer to work with? Like, what is like the one oh, wow. that you like get really excited about? That is a good question. I <laughs> truly love working with any of them. Um, that sounds like a dumb answer, I suppose, but I really enjoy working with different, uh, different industries. I mean, I've had a lot of experience with some of the ones I've sent over to you, but, um, getting to work with a different industry is really interesting because I have a lot of new questions. Um, mm. and just for me, part of the reason I started my own business and work with different clients is because from my perspective, it's just enjoyable to learn more. And when I, when I'm kind of fresh coming into an industry, I can kind of position myself a little bit more as the, um, as the client that someone might be having, uh, just because I can think about the questions I might have out of the gate. On the other hand, you know, like you had mentioned, I've, I have done quite a few websites for coaches. So from that standpoint, it's also really nice because I have a lot of background experience and kind of know what positioning is helpful. Yeah. Um, so it's really, I don't know, it's really beneficial on both sides, but I'd say the, the main factor that it brings together is that I really enjoy working with small business owners, um, just because, I mean, I'm one myself and it's, it's an exciting position to be in. And also I just really recognize the help that they can need with marketing themselves. And, um, because it's, because I'm kind of a solopreneur, I can help people in those positions where a large, really expensive agency would be much more out of reach. So I, I like that part of it too. Yeah, true. I, I never thought of it that way, but you're right. Whenever it's a new company that you've not really had worked with before, you do mm -hmm. get to put yourself that client, sh those client shoes, like, what would I want to know about this company? Right. right. So, exactly. So tell me, what is your background then? Like what got you, you told me a little bit about why you got started, but what is your background? So I, uh, worked at a marketing communications firm, downtown Kansas city. That's where I'm located. And I was there straight out of college. I graduated from college and went there a week later. And I was there for um, about five years and COVID hit in the middle of that. And so I was working downtown, then started working from home. I kind of knew I wanted to start my own business at some point in my life, but the the shifts that were happening with that small business, I mean, small business and even in a different sense than what I'm doing. It was a team of five, including myself. Um, loved, absolutely loved working there. Um, it's called the creative department. And a lot of what I do now incorporates a lot of the experience and the things that I learned from working with that company. Um, because we worked with a variety of clients and industries, um, but had had to heart for nonprofit and small business in doing that. Um, but yeah, whenever COVID happened, that kind of shifted things within our business. And I just felt like I was at a point where, you know, I could probably honestly make a little more money doing this on my own. <laughs> and, um, that was one of the, that was one of the draws. And, um, that was kind of when I decided to launch my business, which was in May, 2021. Ah, okay. Perfect. Good. Mm -hmm. So what's your education look like? Yeah. So I graduated from K-State with a degree in, or I got a bachelor of fine arts and I had a focus in graphic design. And then I also minored in uh, journalism and mass communications, which is a part of what my writing background comes in from. Um, 
so those were kind of two two things that come together and benefit with what I'm doing now. Awesome. Cool. I didn't never knew that about you. Yeah. So that's yeah. <laughs> Um, and for those that are watching or listening, so Laura did my website, so <laughs> check yeah. it out, videocoaching.com. But, um, but it's really, it's really great. So, um, and I did, did not know those things. I'm remiss. I did. Yeah. Not I was like, I now. don't think I had told you that before. <laughs> no. Um, so when it comes to design preferences and so forth, um, what are some design trends that you think work best? And when you're, you're designing these websites, for your clients, do you take into consideration the audience and the type of business it is? Um, can you give me some information about that? Yeah. Um, so I maybe take a somewhat unpopular approach with design trends uh, only, and it's kind of hard to answer because that can be so broad um, depending on what the focus is. Um, but I tend to operate from the mindset that I don't want to adjust my work too much to whatever the trend is simply because it if i do that too much it can become outdated in just a couple of years and that's not mm -hmm. really something that you want to have happen you know say you design an entire website based on this really and weird color or something that um, is very trendy at the time but quickly becomes very outdated you know we just don't want to base the decisions around that too much um and for, from my perspective, a better approach is to look at what your target audience. So that kind of brings in the audience question, bring in yep. what your audience is drawn to. So, you know, you might really like some design trend that's out there, but it has nothing to do with your target audience and they're not interested in it. So that's not really going to benefit you very well. Um, but as far as, uh, you know, working in the uh, target audience, that's very much what we do in the intake process at the beginning um, when I'm gathering input from you. So like, I really want to understand target audience. And usually as a business owner, you want um, your website to be appealing to you, but because you look at it so often, but even more, we want to target that audience first, uh, who you're really wanting to reach. So um, I kind of mentioned this with the bright color example, but a very obvious example would be, you know, if you really love girly floral designs, but you're wanting to appeal to corporate businessmen, then we're probably yeah. not going to be putting a bunch of pink <laughs> swirls all over your site. Yeah. Um, and, and also that's just a really, that's where I really like to collaborate um, with the business owner on it because I know that I'm the design expert, but I also understand that you're the expert of your business. So I need to be able to clue in to what you know about your audience and make sure that that comes through in a design. Awesome. And, um, and I know that about you when in that intake por portion that you, you know, you, you, um, you have a good eye for understanding. Like I remember yeah. when we were going through, um, for the branding, mm -hmm. we're going to hit, hit this in a second, but the fonts and, mm -hmm. and stuff, you're like, oh, I think this would be better actually. And it, yeah. it was nice because I was like, oh, I didn't think about how it looked to other people. Like to me, mm -hmm. all this fun cursive -y stuff looks great. Right. But you're like, right. it's not so easy to read. It's not yeah. it's harder on the eyes. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, I guess, how do you, how do you gather that information about the project from your future clients or prospective clients? to better understand their goals, but then also in a way that it aligns with the client's brand and their, their, um, their values. Cause you know, I have a specific set of values that I wanted to be, right. be um, showcased on certain points of my website. Right. So how do you do those things? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, uh, I have over the years developed a pretty good system as far as the questions that I want to be sure we hit. And I always, Based on what I know up front and the stage of business, I kind of compile those questions into kind of a custom questionnaire. And we really, you know this, we hit those in about an hour yeah. um, and kind of just, I'm going to interview you. And this is probably a little bit where you see my journalism side coming out because of the interviewing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's when I really want to just do a lot of listening and hearing what you're saying. And often the the questions that I ask are intentionally repetitive so that I can kind of see what 
things keep coming to surface. And that usually is insightful about values, like you mentioned. Um, but one of the other things that I do after that discussion, so for example, when you and I were going through the branding process and I'm looking at colors, I'm, I'm looking into the color psychology a little bit and doing that research to see how do these val like what what colors kind of come out with these values that are being mentioned? And sometimes they align well and just naturally, um, and other times not as much. And there's you know there's more that goes into it, but um, those those are kind of the ways that I I bring that to light. I really want to be able to showcase you and your business and what it represents. I mean, especially from a logo perspective, um, you know, you really have to take all of that into consideration to fit it into a simple design. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question a little bit, but. Oh, it does. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like how you said the psychology behind it because there is some psychology to it and you're mm -hmm. right. I mean, me being a Christian woman and the mm -hmm. values that I uphold, you know, my favorite colors are actually red and yellow, but I'm like, mm -hmm. this is not going to vibe with yeah. business because um, it can be a little off-putting for some people. It's not, uh -huh. it's usually not a mauve red. It's usually like the chief's red, like, like the bright, red, bright red, yellow, yeah. like the chief's color, which is all. And it's always interesting too, because every, pretty much every color has, you know, a positive and a negative connotation. So you could think of red, for example, I'm pretty sure we did talk about red because red can be, you know, angry and aggressive and intense, but it can also be really powerful and inspiring and exciting. And so there are always, you know, different things yeah. that come in with that same thing with yellow and I mean, any color, but yeah, <laughs> but um, so yeah, so we chose a color palette that was probably a little bit more softer to on the eye uh -huh. and stuff, but um, yeah, anyways, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so tell me about, I, I know that I know that you build your websites to be mobile friendly because let's face it, people spend more time on their phones than they do on their device on like a laptop or mm -hmm. what have you, in my opinion. Um, so whenever you're customizing websites for your clients, what is the approach you take to like a responsive design for your websites? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. Having a responsive website is extremely important, not only because especially now, um, if you don't have a responsive site, Google can ding you for, you know, they're not going to prefer your site in search engines um, if it's that. not responsive, because then the, they're very much about having content that's helpful for the user. And so if you're, if you're not responsive, then they're just going to cut you out of um, a search list. Um, but mm. also it's just not going to serve your audience well, if you don't have a responsive site, exactly what you were saying. If it's not mobile friendly and your audience is primarily on a phone and you can't read anything that's there, then it's not going to be super helpful. So whenever I'm going through the design process, I always start with the desktop design so you can get really a full view of what it would look like in kind of the intended application, I would say. Um, I'm always thinking about how things are going to be able to reflow because um, when you put it in mobile, it's going to just get, you know, a bunch more narrow. Um, so I'm also thinking back to the target audience at this point as well, because um, one example is I have a client who works with people who are moving into retirement or they're in retirement. And so these are going to be people who their eyes are maybe you know, not quite as good as they yeah. once were, <laughs> stereotypically. Um, and so I'm not going to make the text on the website alarmingly large, but I am going to maybe make it a little bit bigger than if a 20 something were looking at a website. Um, and the same is true when you're moving from a desktop to a phone, making sure it the legibility is maintained. So if the font if or if the type size is a certain size on a desktop, we might either maintain that or bump it up a little bit on mobile. And we're thinking about how they're going to be able to take in that information. Um, this is also a really good thing to evaluate after a site has been active for a few months. Um, if we set up Google Analytics, we can usually evaluate whether the site is being accessed more often on a desktop or a laptop or um, a tablet or a phone, and then kind of make our decisions around that. So if you are finding that a lot of your audience is looking at your website on a phone, then we better really make sure that's where what we're tackling is we're looking at the mobile view 
ahead of the, and they would call that mobile first design, looking at that ahead of the desktop design. Um, and sometimes that testing in itself can be really surprising. Kind of what you were saying, a lot of people do expect um, people to look on their phones and that to be more, you know, where you see your audience coming in or where the traffic is coming from. But there have been times where it's, you know, I've expected that and then it's been more people on a desktop. So it just, it's always good to check that by, you know, on a very specific basis to what it, what it makes sense for who's coming to your website. That makes sense. It's funny because I order some vitamins through a certain um, company and their website is not mobile friendly oh, at all. And my home warranty, <laughs> I, I'm like, what in the Sam Dickens? And then my, my home warranty company is the same way. I'm like, this is so, I don't want to have to scroll this way on my phone. Exactly. I'm it's like, so frustrating. It is. I'm like, you guys need a better website. And I'm like, it's not that hard. Seriously. Well, and you can tell from that experience, it makes you want to just go away and find something else that's going to work better for you. I mean, it can totally deter people. You think about that if you're already an established customer, for example, but if you're brand new and looking at that, that makes people go away really, really fast. It does. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of distasteful. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's a repellent. <laughs> it is. It's, and that kind of goes back to even the psychology of what we were talking about. It's this kind of instant feeling of, wow, my, like this company isn't really thinking about me as a user and how I'm going to interact with their brand. And so right. you want to make sure that that's taken care of. Right. Thank you. That was, thank you for affirming me. Cause I'm like, oh, geez, <laughs> You're this is ridiculous. Like everyone's <laughs> got a mobile friendly site nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. Like you would think. So fresh some restaurants I can kind of get it, I guess. Like, like with their um, menus. Yeah. I mean, but oh my gosh. Oh, well. Um, so how, so when it comes to customization and flexibility, um, how customizable are your websites for your clients? Um, and do you have pre-made templates or do you just create custom, um, designs from scratch, which, mm -hmm. what, what do you have and what do you prefer, I guess? I typically do customized websites. Um, they're all very custom. I do have um, kind of a WordPress theme that I leverage um, to do kind of the basic building blocks, you could say, so that I'm not, you know, there could be a lot of code that you could get into oh, that yeah. would make it take forever if you, you know, if you did it from scratch every single time. Um, but I do it as custom as possible. Um, every site I build is custom created from those building blocks, you could say. Um, okay. And I use some of the same principles as far as font size, you know, just knowing um, what the standard legibility needs to be, kind of what we were talking about before. I adjust that based on the audience. Um, but I know kind of some general spacing things that I want to be sure I carry out in every project. And that goes back to the user experience a little bit. Um, but I, so I custom build all of that. I always use WordPress. I have worked with other websites and I'll do that if, if somebody needs it. Um, but WordPress is kind of my preferred platform. It's good for getting a uh, solid SEO implemented. Um, and just like getting all the customization functionality that you really want out of a website. Um, I've just found that to all be really, really solid. Um, so as far as I can't remember if you had mentioned this, but making, um, if somebody wants to go in and make changes, I kind of, I kind of do that based on the client as well. I really try to make the overall experience from working with me as custom as possible, um, some people want to get in and get their hands dirty and other people do not want to touch it at all. So I'm, I'm totally flexible on, you know, showing you how to work with it, um, or not <laughs> Yeah, and empowering you in whatever way that looks like. And you do. And I thank you for that. Cause you and I had <laughs> that, that point where you showed me how to do things. I'm like, I've already yeah. forgotten by the way. I'm like, I, <laughs> I was going to do it. And I'm like, yeah, no, not doing that. I'll just, I'll just send you a message and see yeah. if you can snap it in for me. So exactly. <laughs> or do whatever for me. <laughs> Good. Um, so when it comes to content management systems, um, what do you recommend for your web, for your website or any website really? And why, or do you have any preference or anything to really add about that? I don't have a huge, strong feeling about it. I, I know some about what we use for you. Um, but I would say that the CMS is not quite as much of what I, 
I do as often. Usually it's a kind of, hey, I have this established. Can you come in and help? Um, so I've worked with a few different ones, but I don't know that I've kind of uh, worked with them so consistently that I have a super strong opinion. I think a lot of them can work well for you. I mean, I've worked with probably MailChimp more often than anything, and that's going to be a lot. Not everyone knows that they have kind of a CMS, um, and that's just because they do a lot of email um, correspondence that you can do with it. So I wouldn't say I have a strong preference about uh, what what's used. Um, mm -hmm. I think there are quite a few good ones out there. Because I use Entreport, as you know, mm -hmm. so I know that I know that you that you know how to use it. Let's put it that way. Right. Thank you for helping me so much with that. That's helped <laughs> yeah. <me> a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but anyways, okay, good, good. And I think it depends too on your size of business. And cause I think yeah. what you're using Entreport is a super powerful tool. Um, and I think it can be really beneficial as long as you kind of set it up right and make it work for you. I think, I think that's pretty good. All right. Well, and honestly, I tried setting it up myself because I'm all about trying to learn as much as uh -huh. possible. That way, if I can't get a hold of you, I can maybe do mm -hmm. something on my own, right? Right. Um, but I still know I'm not using it to the to the Full amount potential. that I could. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I got I'm, but you know, I, I got some time now, so I can kick that yeah. out of it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so, user experience. Um, how do you prioritize user experience and usability in your in your designs and um. How do you ensure though, that while you're doing that, that it's intuitive and easy to navigate as well? Mm, yeah. Um, I will say this is kind of a vague answer in the sense that like, it's kind of something innate that I, I, I mentioned this a little bit before, but when I'm building a website, there's some standard practices that I kind of just know I want to implement. Um, and some of that is just creating the right amount of space between one of the things that comes to mind often is if you go to a website and there are all these buttons that are really close together and you can't click on it very well, like that's going to be a bad user experience. Yeah. So I'm always making sure that if we have a button, there's enough space around it. So when it is scaled down to mobile, it's going to be a size that can, someone can click on with their finger. Um, and they don't have to worry about getting it you know, clicked just right so that it will work. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, also just creating enough space so that you have time to digest the content. I, I try to create, a, I have kind of a system that I use to um, space things out so that it will work well for the user. Um, and then another thing is just keeping things consistent as far as um, using headlines in the same way um, so that someone can follow the hierarchy of a page more easily and you can guide the user to what you want them to digest. So if you have, you know, a headline the same size on every page, that's going to help them know, here's what I'm looking at first, then I'm looking at this smaller text and, oh, now here's a button that's guiding me to what, what they want me to do. So um, those are a few examples of, of some of the things that I do. So my assumption is you kind of want that to be that feeling to, for it to feel the same way across every page on the mm -hmm. website. Like every time you make yeah. a transition. Yeah. For example, if you put, um, if you're, usually I make buttons look the same way throughout an entire site, because if you okay. are, if you look at a homepage and you see some of the buttons, you're like, okay, if I see that color and that font, um, that kind of tells me that's an action step for me to take. But if I go to another page and the color is suddenly changed and the font looks different or, you know, it's just the consistency isn't there. Your yeah. brain doesn't your brain doesn't make sense of what they're supposed to do. So you almost feel like you're on a different site or, you know, yeah. not looking at the same thing. And and so that even just that subtle adjustment can throw a user off. Well, there's one, I'm glad you mentioned that because there's one time I was filling out a, um, I can't remember if it was a survey or what, what it was ugh, for someone. It might've been an application for something. I don't know. Anyways, what I thought was going to be yes would have been blue, but the no was blue. So I clicked the wrong one. I'm like, oh, oh. yeah. Because I, and in the, in the past, it was like the, uh, the, the no was blue, but the yes was white. And in the past, oh. it always been like, you know, I don't know why, but to confirm, you'd click the the one that was more colorful is how right. I thought of it. And I was like, 
son of a gun. It got me like, yeah, that's a great example. I mean, just, but you know, that color draws your eye to what you Mm -hmm. wanted to do. And maybe they wanted me to answer. No, maybe that's why they were trying to guide you there. (laughs) They got me. But anyways, um, (laughs) but that's anyway, so that, that makes sense. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. um, That is very true. Yeah. I mean, it does, it does. It draws your eye to those things. So I'm sure that you take that into consideration too. Mm-hmm. Like, what's, you know, what's going to make the user, you know, com- more compelled to hit the yes button. Let's exactly. make it a certain color, you know, I mean, right. I um, so you mentioned SEO earlier. So that, um, that search engine optimization for those people that don't know what that means, but, um, can you kind of tell a little bit about how you incorporate that into your websites and why it's so important to have that SEO, um, portion built into the website? Yeah. So I'll say, uh, up front, I'm not an SEO expert. I, I know enough about it to kind of incorporate the basic amount, but it SEO is one of those things that is changing so rapidly all the time. And I have connections with a couple of partners who that's what they do all the time. And so um, typically if there is um, a client who's wanting to do, you know, really, really get into SEO, it's going to be, that's going to be a time I bring somebody from the outside in um, just because they have, they have their pulse on the market and they have, there's some pretty expensive software that you can pay for on a monthly or annual basis to be able to track um, SEO on or, and, and figure out your conversions well. And I mean, there's just a ton that you can do with it, but I do make sure from, you know, what I can control of a basic setting up a website that I'm implementing some of those core, um, SEO elements and usually I, um, you know, this, I, I typically offer my project plans in three tiers. And so usually there's going to be more SEO incorporated as you, you know, go up in that, but some of those, uh, initial things are just incorporating, um, image alt text. So making sure some of the keywords are incorporated on pages, um, adjusting page titles. So the keywords are incorporated there. Um, One way to that's really helpful is if um, you're using a blog to figure out your keywords for SEO blogs are some people have the feeling that that they don't read blogs. So other people don't read blogs, but that is a really, really good way to have people find you kind of what I said earlier, Google prefers content that's helpful to users. And so if you're regularly updating your website, you're going to just naturally perform better in search results. And by updating your blog, you're incorporating more of those keywords. And if someone's looking for something that you've mentioned in one of your blog posts, you're going to be more likely to show up there. So it used to be that with SEO, you would kind of stuff all these keywords into the background. You wouldn't be able to see it. Um, but that's now become frowned upon in the last few years as, you know, Google sees that as that's not helpful. You're just trying to boost yourself. And so they're looking for more organic, um, keyword incorporation. So anyway, all that to say, um, I have a, I have a plugin that I typically use on the website, on the websites I create and kind of fill in those basic, uh, page title, meta description, image, alt text. Um, get that set up on a site so that some of the keywords we talk about, uh, assuming that I'm helping with SEO at this point, um, that I'm integrating those into the site. And that's always something we can add later on to. Okay, perfect. That reminds me, I'm like, oh, I need to, I haven't done my blog. I kind of got a little lax on it. So <laughs> now I got time again. I'm it's kicking a lot it up to keep again. up with. It's a lot. It is. It is. So, um, you mentioned timelines and deliverables. You said there's usually about three phases you said, right? So can you walk us through what that looks like for that timeline and those deliverables Mm -hmm. for your clients? Yeah. So the, the three that I mentioned, I typically offer, um, kind of three tiers of a project. So say we're going to, um, do a website project. I'll say, here's kind of the essential, the very bare bones of what I'd recommend you do. Here's kind of a mid-level professional tier. And then here's kind of the elite where it's all the fixings, all of what I'd recommend based on where you are. Um, Within within the 
what I have interpreted as your budget and what would kind of be reasonable for you. Um, and then kind of from there, uh, I also develop a timeline that suggests when our kind of major deadlines will be. I, I would say generally most websites that have about four to five pages take about six to eight weeks um, to complete, just going through the discussion process, the intake process, and then going through the process of building it. Um, and then websites with, I'd say, 12 or more pages are going to be more like 12 to 16 weeks. And then I've done some larger websites that have, you know, 30 plus pages, and those take a lot more time. And that's usually when I'm working with somebody who's a bigger organization, has a bigger team, have a lot more voices involved. And so they have different processes for approvals than if I'm working with somebody who's, you know, it's just a one-on-one, -on -one. like when you and I would be working on it, you're not needing to go get approvals from all these other people. Right. Um, that makes, and that makes sense. Yeah. And then as far as um, the whole process goes, we do that initial conversation about what are we wanting to accomplish with this project, that questionnaire that I take you through. Um, and typically from there, um, I'll develop a website wireframe, which is just breaking out the content in a really not designed way. It is designed, but isn't designed just to say, hey, we're not going to look at color. We're not going to get hung up on any of the you know major design elements, but let's talk about the content and make sure that we have that really clear before we um, move forward with actually incorporating color and design and photography and that kind of thing. Um, and so that usually is a static design phase that we're looking at PDFs. And then once we've kind of worked through the approvals and tweaks, um, then I will build that on the actual site and do a review of that. That makes sense. Um, <laughs> Cause I remember, I remember the first one you sent through to me was in black and white. Cause like uh -huh. you, and I didn't realize at the time, but now I do that. You didn't want to focus on the, mm -hmm. you want to focus just on the content of the page. Mm -hmm. We'll plug in all the rest of the stuff. The, the, exactly. the important part is the content and make sure yeah. that makes and I and I did the same thing to you with uh logo and yeah. that can I know that that's I know that that can be hard but that color can it's kind of what you were saying about the buttons how you're like oh I was drawn to this button so I clicked this button the same thing can happen with color it's like oh I just really like this color so now I think I like this logo when actually this design is maybe a little stronger for what I want so that is another thing just stripping away um, some of those elements to make you, make you focus a little differently. That, that makes, that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't think about that, but you're right with the, with the logo. <laughs> I forgot we did that. There, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. And you're not one of the only ones to be like, where's the color? Can I see this in color? I'm like, we'll get there. I promise. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it is hard. I mean, it is. think about the discipline you have to have to not just cave <laughs> and be like, okay, Miss customer, I will give you what you want. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, so I, I know this, but it is one of my questions, but just talking about, um, about collaboration and communication. I know that you and I communicated a lot via email. You text with me, um, you do phone calls with me, but I do appreciate that you're disciplined with, I have this time and this time available. And sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll be available immediately. And sometimes you won't be, but how do you prefer yeah. to communicate and collaborate with your clients when working on the design of their website. Yeah. Um, so kind of, I mean, you preface this well, I do really try to accommodate how I communicate just based on what works best. Um, you know, for example, sometimes we send voice text back and forth and I know that can be a helpful way to, oh, I don't have the time to like type something out, but I really want to get this across and maybe you don't have time so you can listen to it when when you can. And so I'm I'm more than happy to, accommodate in that way. Um, I do typically communicate by email just because it helps me stay organized and also gives both of us time to process any um, written notes. Um, sometimes that can be helpful for me or to just go back and reference something. Sometimes if we talk about something on the phone and I don't note it, I mean, you could probably imagine that I'm a visual learner just because of what I do. Yeah, exactly. But, um, right. <laughs> sometimes if I don't have something written out in front of me, I don't retain it in the same way. And so for me, it's helpful to have that written communication. Um, and that's also a good way for us both to have something to go back to when I'm communicating about deadlines. Because even when we go through the 
proposal process, I'll say, you know, here are our, here's an overview of all the deadlines we're going to go through. But as we get to those step by step, I like to communicate about here's where we are. Um, here's the next deadline that you have. And once you kind of come back to me with those revisions, then I'm going to deliver something to you again at this stage. So I do really try to communicate that process well. Um, so yeah, email. And then I'll also, some people communicate with me over Slack, um, which would oh. be a similar way of, you know, getting a message over quick, similar to text. Um, and then I also, if someone's using Adobe programs, I can share PDFs that way. And um, we can leave comments back and forth on there. So again, that is another written method. Um, so I say that ultimately tends to work well as far as communi communicating content um, and changes. Um, but again, I try to adapt based on what works best. Right, right. And I know that about you, which I love. So I appreciate <laughs> that. And I do, I send voice texts and I was like, I want people to hear the soul behind this. Like <laughs> why, or like you're, like you said, I'm in a hurry and I'm like, Okay, yeah, and I've got a book here and I'm not typing a book. So you're yes. getting the <laughs> exactly you're yes. getting the message. Um, so cost and budget, what does that look like? Typically, um, I know you've got this stuff, I think, on your website, don't you? I think I've sent you a PDF of it. That's what it is. I don't okay. think I have uh my website. I need to update my own website, which is kind of funny. You know, I spend all this time on other people's website, but oh yeah, yeah update my own. <laughs> Um, so I don't have, I don't think I have anything on my website, but I always, you know, I can always send that to somebody. I have documents that I share that breaks all of that down. And then as far as what you were saying with a website project, I had mentioned this earlier that I do kind of the three tiers, um, when I'm doing project-based pricing. And so that gives you some, a few options to consider, and yep. whenever I deliver that, I include a breakdown what of what each of those options includes. So there's just kind of a checklist of, and so you can see the three columns and compare kind of how it, how it runs across those three. Um, that is kind of the, that would be on a project basis. Um, yep. Sometimes there are people who want to just jump into something really quickly. Um, and at that point, I'll maybe do an hourly rate. Um, that just allows us to, get started on something quicker just because I am not going back and estimating all of the work that we're going to be doing. Right. Um, but again, just because it is me, I try to, I try to customize that as much as possible. Well, and I know there, there are maybe some things that people that are new to websites aren't aware of cost wise. Oh, yeah. Are there any like, like things maybe I mean, for example, buying their domain and stuff like that. That's that exactly one that I was the thinking cost. of. Mm -hmm. The domain was definitely one I was thinking of. Um, if you if someone comes and they haven't purchased a domain, that's something that I can manage for them. Or if you know somebody wants to go do that, um, really either way. But that is an additional cost is purchasing a domain. Um, and the price varies depending on what your domain is that you're looking for. Um, and then there's also web hosting, which is different than buying the domain. So that's usually an additional cost. Um, I host a number of websites. And so there's usually, you know, I, I typically share what that is um, if someone's needing a web host, but then also saying, you know, you can go find your own. But I also, because I host a number of websites, I could get a discount. Um, those would be some uh, hard costs I would think of. There was one other I had written down. Oh, also if there's... Um, some functionality that you really want to incorporate into a website that's maybe beyond the standard. So there are quite a few free um, third-party plugins that WordPress um, will accept, but a lot of them also have premium versions. So that, that can be either a one-time cost or a monthly cost or an annual cost. It just kind of depends. Okay. Um, so for example, I've added on some event calendars for a few of my clients and there are a limited amount of free options available, but then if you get kind of the add on, you know, you can do a little bit more with it. I sent you one where we have a um, ticketing platform incorporated so that someone can buy a ticket on the website. And so there's an additional thing that comes with that to create that functionality. Um, and I'd say for the most part, a lot of that is fairly reasonable. Um, but 
we always look at that depending on what the need is. There's usually something out there, um, but that can add to the cost. Um, again, a hard cost that's kind of separate from what we're already doing. Right. And like, I know for me, you know, we have thrive cart, we kind of connected into some, into some things right. and, um, the pop-up windows for mm-hmm. people to roll into things. And exactly. I know those are all different items that you add, but I know that there's some back end things, um, like tying in the thrive cart to the pop-up if they're, if it, they're buying something that, that is something you can do as well. And mm-hmm. you're really great at, cause I don't have to do it. So I thank you for that. <laughs> you're so welcome. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there are always, and I think that's a good example of kind of when we get beyond, you know, so like we finished your website project. And then um, if we don't come up with one of these maintenance plans, that's a kind of here, I'm doing this much support for you per month, you know, maybe it varies and you want to just do it as an, on an as needed basis that can certainly add up um some additional costs outside of the kind of defined project. But if we're working on a project and something kind of falls outside of the scope, I'll, I'll communicate about that. And that's kind of why I try to be really clear about what round of revisions we're on so that it's not a surprise. Um, You know, I'm not just going to surprise charge you and be like, here, you owe me this now, but I never talked to you about it. Um, I try to really communicate about anything that is potentially outside of scope so that we can talk about it and you can decide if you really want to move forward with that or if you want to kind of pull back. Yep. And you did that with me and I appreciate it. And that that kind of goes into like the maintenance and support portion, because I know that, I know that you offer that support package, which is phenomenal and you do the ad hoc or the a la carte, you know, Mm -hmm. so, so that's great as well. And I think the a la carte or uh, ad hoc, what you want to call it is like an hourly rate. Is that Mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, I, I offer I think I some, more of that. Yeah. So I offer um kind of similar to the project plans that I mentioned with the three tiers. I have three tiered options for just maintenance, and then I have three tiered options for maintenance plus support. Um the the basic maintenance packages include a small amount of support, but the the support packages include, you know, a couple extra hours. I think I can't remember what my highest one is, but you know, six hours of support a month let's say. Um, But some people, I only do 15 minutes of support a month. And that can be, hey, I just need this, uh, this copy changed here. And and usually they'll let me know what they want to do with their time. Um, And yeah, otherwise, it's a an as needed kind of ad hoc. Um, I need this thing implemented on my site. Can you go ahead and do that? We've done that a few times. So yeah. I, appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you're familiar with that one. I'm very much. Yes. <laughs> what about ownership and rights? Um, What does that look like? Do your clients get to own the rights to their website design and code? And um, do you allow them to have full access to it as well as the files and the assets that are embedded within that site? What does that look like? Yeah, that's a good question. So This is also something that I include in my project proposals, but um, the the license I typically offer is a license for limited usage. So essentially that means I'm maintaining the rights, but I offer the client exclusive use of the final deliverables, um, which includes the ability to make any changes to the site. So it, I mean, it kind of feels like you own it. I'd say as far as like from a copyright perspective, I could still retain that. However, um, any content that's created by a client and put on the site is considered to be their, you know, that's your proprietary content. Um, A trademark would be a good example of that. If you trademark a logo and we put it on the website, you know, you still own that trademark. Um, I don't try to prevent clients from using their own site, um, but kind of setting it up that way does eliminate the cost of like transferring ownership Typically, if I've had somebody, oh, we want to kind of take over the rights of a logo that you created, um, then there'd be an additional fee that comes along with that for me to kind of hand over all the use and the benefit they're going to get out of that. Um, So if a client really wants to cut me out and do it on their own, then I mean, I'm totally open to talking about that. Um, And then as far as access I typically um, don't give full administrative access to a website, um, (laughs) mostly because it's just not really needed. Um, 
I'll, I will, if it's, you know, if somebody really wants it, but there's just not really a need for it. Um, I, it also prevents clients from accidentally kind of getting into code that you don't really want to mess up. <laughs> um, if, if you get a little too excited and kind of, I mean, one little character can break a website, which is kind of wild. Um, yeah. so just by not giving that level of access, it just gives a little more peace of mind for everyone typically. Um, but again, I adapt what level of access based on, um, you know, what you want to have. So for example, like we've given you access for when you said, when we had talked about when you might want to write your own blog or put it on there. Um, there are some people who still don't have access to their website because they just don't want to touch it. So ah. <laughs> it really, it really just depends. <laughs> well, and like my husband doesn't do website work per se, but he's, uh -huh. a, he's been a systems architect and now he's a right. senior devs op engineer. So he understands like one, like symbol, like you yeah. said, in, in code yeah. can break it. Like, and in his job, sometimes people get fired for those things. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, because it can create big problems. Oh, it can for sure. Absolutely, hundred percent. So, um, do you do you recommend people do their own websites? And um, and if say they already have, is it is and they they're like I'm up over my I'm over my head in this website. Do you ever help people get out of that situation? <laughs> Yes. Uh, yes. I, I think if you feel empowered to do your own website, then you certainly can. Of course, from my perspective is just because I'm a professional in that field, I would want to be able to help with that. And there are just things if you, you know, if you aren't in that position that you just may not know. Um, but it's, there's certainly a lot of tools out there that make it possible. Um, I have helped people who either they had, they tried to do a website themselves and they weren't happy with it. Um, I'll kind of take that content and move it into something else. Um, there have been times where someone said, I've made this website, can you just tweak it and fix it and make it look better? Um, so I've done that as well, even if it's not on WordPress. Um, so again, it just kind of depends, but I can definitely come in and help. I've also had people say, could you just spend a couple of hours giving me recommendations, um, about what I could do differently on my site. And so I've come in with things like that. I, I kind of wonder when are people come to you and ask you those questions, do they end up just like, do you, I mean, do they ever just end up like saying, okay, that that's it. Like, I've got to have you do this. Um, that's typically what happens. <laughs> okay. I would um, think because I'm like, naturally I would say that like, okay, I'm in over my head. We're done. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not that I'm trying to force somebody to give it to me, but usually, <laughs> usually just from talking about what you can do some, it's easy to, there are a lot of facets to it. So it's easy to get overwhelmed and feel like, um, I don't know how I'm going to do all of that. That's way more than I can handle. And I mean, as you would think of too, when you're a business owner and needing to create a website, you're your expert in your field and you aren't going into it thinking, oh, I have to now create and maintain a website. That's just right. a whole other thing to have to do. So, um, yeah, it is kind of common that if I explain a few suggestions, someone's like, okay, please help me. <laughs> right. Well, for instance, I, I could cut my own hair. Yeah. I'm not going to. Right. I can only imagine what I would look like if I did. <laughs> and, and Very then amazing. also too, I mean, it's a time suck. I mean, just think oh, about man. how much time as a business owner I would spend. Cause I spent a lot of time teaching myself how to use the stuff in Entreport, how to do thrive right. carts and those things. Cause I feel like, I feel like for me, I needed to have a little bit idea of knowledge of how to use certain mm -hmm. parts of it, but Which I think it's good. Whole, what'd you say? Which is good. I mean, having yeah. an understanding, cause then, especially as we're working together, then you kind of know what you're asking. A right. Little better. But to do the whole website would be like so much time taken. And whenever you have a huge audacious goal and you're just wanting to get, get it started and done, right? you know, that's the one thing that may stop your momentum. So absolutely. absolutely. I, I'm all about letting it go. Yeah, <laughs> letting absolutely. It go. And it, it certainly does become a little bit of a trade-off of looking at what you're willing to put in and, um, you know, kind of the example you were talking about before of, you know, if somebody wants to go in and make their own edits, they certainly, I want to empower them to be able to do that. 
But a lot of the time to have me do something is going to be a couple minutes. And for them, it might be half an hour. And so uh, for just real. because I'm just because I'm so much more familiar with it, I just yeah. I don't have to take all this time to figure out how to do it. Um, so even that saves a lot of time. Well, it made me think about, I can't remember what it was. I can't remember if it was one of my workshops that we were kind of going back and forth about or, um, a master. I can't remember what it was. Anyways, you and I were going back and forth about something and, um, not in a bad way, obviously just talking about the website and getting, right. getting the pop-up. Right. And you had it done in like that. And then <laughs> it would have taken me 30 minutes to an hour just mm-hmm. to do it. But then also finding time in my day to stop doing what I was doing to do that thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm right. like, oh, it's nice. I just have Laura. I just send Laura a message. And exactly. Bob's well, for you, you want to be able to prioritize other parts of your business. You want to be moving forward on your content. And you're like, I don't have time to make this pop up. Someone else do it for me. Right, exactly. I'm passing that buck to someone else. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But if you've got those clients that are like, come heck or high water, I'm doing this myself. What are some major components to a website that all websites should have if mm-hmm. you're going to do your own. And then are there specific watch outs when people mm-hmm. are creating their own site that you would tell you would advise people to steer clear of? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'd say from a content perspective, and we kind of went over this, this content a little bit earlier is just like clarifying who you are, what you do, what you're offering to your target audience and being really, really clear on that. Um, Knowing all of that up front and being able to communicate about it on a website is going to be extremely crucial. Um, At a basic level, I'd say most websites should have a home page, an about page, and a contact page. Typically, you're going to have more than that, depending on you know what makes sense for your business. But if you think of your website as kind of your digital storefront, you should think about what information your ideal client or customer needs to be able to. Um, give them really clear action about uh, what direction you want them to take whenever they come to your site. Um, So I'd say those are some of the basic components. Um, You'll probably think of this too, from whenever we went through your site, having, if, if you're the face of your company, having some of your own photography is extremely beneficial. Um, So having that is really good. Um, You can always, there's are a lot of options for free stock photography but the more you can personalize it is it's just a lot better. It's just always better to have your own authentic content. I um, could not agree with you more. Yeah, I know you, I said stock and you're like cringing. I know I'm like stock. <laughs> like, yeah. I talk about this with my clients when it comes to, to like, you are your brand, whether you want to mm-hmm. be or not, you are a business owner. So people are going to look mm-hmm. at you and to you four things. So exactly, exactly. And it just gives them a better idea. Think about, I mean, if you put some random person on your website, it would be extremely confusing to people. (laughs) Very confusing. Like, I don't even know who Lydia is. I've never seen a picture of her. I mean, that would be bizarre. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Um, Oh my God. And then as far as things to watch out for, um, so I mentioned that I build websites on WordPress, but there are a lot of website builders that um, may be a better option just because it is a little more um, non-coder, non-developer friendly. Um, So I think Squarespace is typically a good option for that. Mm, Um, A lot of people use Wix and I, I mean, some people have different opinions. I absolutely hate Wix. (laughs) I do not recommend it ever to anyone. Um, Squarespace, I do think is a good Uh, option if you're wanting to build something yourself. Um, They have a lot of good templates. um, So that's a good option. And then, yeah, kind of, I mentioned going in with a clear message and a plan. Sometimes people will create their own websites without really thinking it through. And then there's a whole bunch going on. The message isn't clear, or it's just the message is completely non-existent. Yeah. Um, So I'd say if you're confused about what your offering is, then your ideal customer or your ideal client is going to be confused about what your offering is. So like making sure that you have that nailed down before you throw something out on your website um, is really, really important. And then um, I'd also say if you're securing a domain yourself um, and it gives you the option to secure your site with SSL, um, make sure you do that. Um, in most cases, SSL, it stands for security site lock. Um, 
it's offered for free in most cases, but it is just kind of, you know, on when you go to a website and there's the little lock icon in the browser, yeah. that's pretty much what it is. And it's, so it's securing your website, securing your information. Um, and it just kind of protects it a little bit more. Did not know that was a thing, first of all. Okay. Yeah. And now a I good do. example of how there are <laughs> website things that you just are like, you know, <laughs> I'm like, that's important. Huh? Imagine huh. that. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how can people get a hold of you? Yeah. So, um, you can, as I, you know, I talked about email before, so you can always email me. My email is Laura at design on purpose, kc.com. Um, and then you can also reach out to me on my contact form on my website, which is design on purpose, kc.com. Um, that goes to the same place. Uh, and then you can also reach me by phone at 913-544-3190. Perfect. Great. And do you prefer to a phone call or a text? Uh, either way, I would say, I, I mean, I try to be pretty responsive to phone calls. Um, I'm just not always as, you know, if you want to talk for a few minutes, that's usually I can answer. Um, and then if we have to talk for a lot longer, then I'll usually excuse me, usually set aside more time to chat, but either way. Perfect. Great. Well, Laura, this was amazing. Thank you so much. And I will be sharing this here shortly. I might not have to edit this much, which is amazing. Again, hey. <laughs> um, I know I'll take it, but what does the back of your sign say? I see, I gather you. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's probably been annoying you for so long. <laughs> I'm like, is it father or gather? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. And then Uber, my last name. Yeah. Um, so that's the U, but yeah, sorry that I should have moved over sooner. <laughs> okay. I was like, what does that say? <laughs> okay. Now I get it. Gather you. Okay, good. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. This is such a blessing to me. I'm sure it'll be a blessing to everyone else that watches and a blessing to you as well. So mm -hmm. I thank you so much and take care. Thank you so much. Yep. Bye.